This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used, for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome again to this lecture on thermal unit operations. We are still in the introductory section and I will tell you something today about examples, examples for different separation units and finally tell you something about process intensification, a relatively modern topic. Now, what are the first things we want to look at? The examples of different thermal separation processes. And we learned in the previous lectures that uh, for performing such a separation, we generate a two-phase system. So it makes sense to sort, so to speak, the different unit operations uh, with respect to the phases that, that are in contact. And so we have on the one hand side solid, liquid and gaseous phase, one phase and the other phase can of course be, in, uh, be solid, liquid and a gas as well. Now we can ask ourselves which combinations are, make sense and of course we only have to use half of that uh, matrix because the other half is symmetrical with that. So let's start with the first case, solid and solid, which is actually not feasible for thermal unit operations, for thermal separation processes, because the mass transfer is much too slow in solids, so you don't find that in separation uh, processes. Then the next combination is liquid and solid. One example for that is solution or melt crystallization and practical examples are sugar production from some highly concentrated sugar solution coming from sugar cane or sugar beet. Um, the concentration is increased for example by evaporating uh, the water and then some temperature changes sometimes also are used to induce crystallization of the solids. The solids are highly uh, concentrated in sugar, that is, even after the first crystallization step, you obtain a sugar which is relatively pure. If you want to raffinate that with the second step, you dissolve that sugar again, perform the crystallization a second time, and then you have really very, very pure sugar. Also for silicon wafer production, crystallization is being used. Actually, there one uses a special uh, technique um, in order to um, uh, get not only high purity, but also to induce the formation of a single crystal. And this is the zone melt uh, process, which is used to produce the silicon wafers. So sugar is a solution crystallization and silicon wafer is a melt crystallization process. Another option of how to perform separation with a liquid and a solid system is adsorption, where the counter process is being called desorption. Adsorption means that we have a solid and at the surface of the solid components may adsorb, may attach, so to speak, and by that they are being removed from the surrounding liquid. That can be used, for example, for water purification. Perhaps you have done that at home today already um, because water purification uh, methods in, on, in home appliances they use sometimes active charcoal uh, adsorption which is porous material, very highly porous material to which bacteria and some unwanted components attach and so they are removed from the water. As I said, the desorption is a counter process. It is, if you have something on that solid surface and remove that and release that into a liquid, then that is being called desorption. And as an example, here we have the cleaning of wastewater. Then finally, we have solids, liquids, the solids extraction, also a process that you have possibly already performed today. Uh, for example, brewing coffee or tea, because there you extract something from a solid. And this is actually now again from a bulk solid, so out of the solid material you extract something out of that, whereas adsorption only attaches to the surface. 
One should say that, of course, the surface has to be relatively high and the actual surface for adsorption is not the outer surface of some particle, but actually some internal surface of a very porous material. So this has something to do with the surface of the solids, whereas solids extraction and crystallization is bulk, uh, are more or less bulk products or processes. Solids extraction is not only relevant for brewing coffee or tea, but it is also relevant for removal of or extraction of pharmaceutically active components from plant material. And in all these cases, you take out some components from the solid, transfer it to the liquid, and there you have then your product dissolved in the liquid. For coffee and tea, it's the caffeine as well as the aromatic components. For the pharmaceuticals, is the pharmaceutically active components. The next combination now is liquid and liquid. Example here is the liquid-liquid extraction, or so-called solvent extraction, where you have uh, you add one solvent to some liquid phase in order to extract something out of that liquid phase. One example is again from pharmaceuticals industry. It's extraction of pharmaceuticals from a fermentation broth, for example, where the microorganisms have produce some pharmaceutically active component and that is being extracted with the second liquid phase. Of course, one uh, can also use that in ordinary chemicals production, food production, for example, if you have uh, orange peel oil that contains two major fractions, one are those that are aromatic, those that you want to, you want to have to add them to beverages, for example, they are the aromatic component. And on the other hand side, you have more or less not so aromatic components. They well can be used, for example, as a solvent for eco-friendly paints. This is the limonene in these, uh, in the orange peel oil, and that is then removed, uh, separated, for example, by uh, solvent extraction. Then we look at the next combination, gas and solid. Again, adsorption. So adsorption does not only refer to liquid in contact with a solid, but also for gas in contact with uh, a solid. Again, adsorption, the counter process being desorption. Here, of course, you have now a gas flow that has some impurities, for example. You can adsorb uh, detrimental components from exhaust gas, for example, with activated carbon. That's one option uh, where you use adsorption can also be used for analytical purposes. Gas chromatography actually uses the adsorption of components from the gas to a solid and the desorption a moment later. The combination of these two, so to speak, can be used analytically. Then another topic with gas and solid is sublimation and desublimation. Examples are freeze drying of food or lyophilization of bacteria, which is actually also just freeze drying. Uh, but just for, uh, but specifically for bacteria. And um, the trick here is that you have a solid, frozen water, and that evaporates without passing through the, the liquid state. So the solid ice is directly evaporating. And so that is one option to separate things to, in that case, more or less just, it's just drying process, separating the water from the material that you're interested in, the bacteria, or the dried food. Then finally we come to the major separation process being used in chemical industry, which is distillation or rectification. The distinction between these two is we will learn later in the lectures on distillation. They refer to special combinations of things, so to speak. And distillation is used for the crude oil. Um, well, Preparation to produce gasoline or diesel from that. Distillation is also used to produce spirits, for example, cognac, from corresponding wine. Distillation is the mostly applied separation technology in chemical industry and many other uh, industries that deal with substances. Finally, we have a combination of gas and liquid, which is absorption or desorption. And here one should be careful. Absorption and adsorption, they sound very similar, but they mean different things. Adsorption is always towards a solid, a porous solid, whereas absorption is towards a liquid and a bulk liquid. So it's not just some surface or something like that. 
So the components are really absorbed in the bulk of a liquid phase coming from a gas or the counter process is being called desorption when some component from a bulk of a liquid is transferred to a vapor phase or gas phase for that matter. Um, just for the confusion of students, I always say these desorptions are the same, have the same name, so to speak, as those desorptions. So actually in the context uh, you usually know which desorption is being meant, but they for some reason have the same uh, name, uh, even though they refer to different processes. And I also should mention that absorption and adsorption sometimes is being mixed up if people speak quickly, even experts, if they speak quickly, they sometimes mix it up. But usually, know, you know from the context which of the two is meant. Now, absorption is a technology where you, for example, remove uh, well, toxic components from flue gas by using water. So you spray water, a liquid, into the gas. The liquid then absorbs the um, components that you want to remove and you can remove them then with that water. So that's called gas scrubbing. It's a, there exists an opposite process which is desorption process which is sometimes called stripping. There you have bubbles, gas bubbles that pass through the liquid and more volatile components are being transferred from the liquid to the gas and they can then be removed with the gas stream. The final combination of two phases is gas and gas. Unfortunately, well, two gases usually mix, so they don't form an interface, so it's not so easily possible to use that in a thermal separation process. Only at higher pressure, where you are in the more or less supercritical region, there two phases may form, and there you might use that for separation purposes, but that is usually so extreme that's not really a common process. So combining two gas phases is usually not used in thermal separation processes. With that you get a certain overview over the possibilities that we have as thermal separation processes and there are not many more actually. Now, so this is really the majority of those processes that we have available and we will focus on some of them and we will even realize that most of them can be dealt with on very similar theoretical grounds. The things we will be looking at are those that are most relevant, and this is distillation of course, it's extraction and absorption, and we will also uh, look a little bit at, as, at adsorption. One has to now look which type of video you are, will be looking at or which lecture you are being taking because in the end also the other uh, separation processes will dealt with, but that are advanced topics. Okay, so with that you have a certain overview over those things that are available. In the lecture I now try to give you a certain basic and very fundamental understanding of different aspects, how to deal with those things and how to design such separation processes. One thing that is relatively important are graphical methods. And now you may say, well, graphical methods, I have my computer, I have my simulation tools, they can calculate everything. Of course, you're right, they can do that. But um, graphical methods give you a very nice overview of what happens if you change certain variables. For example, in distillation, you have the chance to vary, for, just as an example, the reflux ratio. It's a key variable, so to speak, of distillation. And you can, of course, perform a simulation that describes what the dependence of all the uh, results of the distillation actually are. But if you have a picture in front of you, a mental picture of such a graphical method, and somebody tells you, well, I want to change this variable in this direction, then you know directly what's going to happen. And that's the nice thing about the graphical methods. They allow you to have a mental picture of what's going on in the separation process. Also, experts from industry tell me that usually they first look at the equilibrium diagram, mentally, so to speak, imagine these graphical methods, put somehow into these um, equilibrium diagrams, and from that realize, for example, if a separation is an easy one or it's going to be a complicated separation. And sometimes they even design the processes based on graphical methods. Then, so to speak, the extreme is shortcut methods. It's analytical methods put, pushed to the extreme by 
some extreme assumptions, usually assuming that you have ideal equilibrium. And that leads then to closed equations that you can solve on the computer, on a, even on a calculator, to determine the amount of theoretical stages, the number of theoretical stages that you need in order to perform a certain specified separation task. They are used to get a first idea of how complicated the separation actually is. They are much less accurate as compared to the graphical methods, but they are quick, easy and dirty. Based on these things, I will then derive a generalized representation of stage processes that will help you to also be able to look at different separation processes. And we will use that then later on in the lecture to see how other separation processes actually work. And we will see that that is very general and very easy to apply. I will deal with batch separation and with continuous operation of separation processes, where batch means that you have some defined amount of your system that you want to separate. You separate that, then empty your equipment, refill it again, perform the separation again. Continuous operation means that you have a continuous flow into your equipment and you have continuous outlet streams and there you have steady state usually, that is nothing changes as a function of time, just the separation is taking place. So here for the continuous operation we usually make the assumption that we have steady state reached, whereas for batch separation we have to take into account the transient behavior, that means that things change as time proceeds. I will also mention to you typical equipment, how that looks like, how it, it looks like internally, so that you know what to expect in industry. And I will show that for most of the common separation processes, and I mentioned to you already distillation, extraction, absorption are those that we are dealing with in the basic course, and the further topics are then being dealt with as supplementary chapters, if you like, or some advanced course. So that is what I want to tell you in this lecture, in the basic part of this lecture. Concerning the advanced topics, one can use this diagram to understand a little bit what we are being talking about. And this is a plot taken from literature, where the technical application is being uh, characterized as either first applications being used or if it's really a large-scale industrial production. And on the other hand side, the technical maturity, where you are either close to the invention or where you have already mathematical models, experimental methods and everything available. And uh, you are running the processes under optimal conditions because you know all the design strat strategies to really run or to get optimal design. This is also characterized that to the left, where you are close to invention, you still have for the uh, to perform lots of experiments for the design because you don't have models really available that are validated, that describe what's going on. Whereas if you are running optimal processes, you need models to find your optimal operation point, so to speak. So here on the right, models are available that reliably describe what's going on in the process. The classical separation processes, of course, they are used in large-scale industrial production and we know how to run them in an optimal uh, situation. So this blob, so to speak, characterizes the situation of classical separations that I've been talking about so far. And now you see here certain, well, strange things, reactive separations and bioreactive separations. What does that mean? Apparently there are two things put together into one equipment reaction and separation simultaneously. And they can combine for different reasons. On the one hand side, you can use the reaction in order to enhance the separation. Yeah, because, for example, if your product uh, that is to be transferred is reacting directly to some other component that is, for example, has a different volatility or different solu solubility, then you are able to increase the driving force for the mass transfer. On the other hand side, it can also be the other way around, that the same separation actually enhances reaction. For example, very often the product is limiting or the product concentration is limiting the equilibrium concentration that you can reach. 
the reactive equilibrium concentration. And if you are able to remove the product out of the reaction zone, you again increase the driving force, but now for the reaction. So separation and reaction can enhance each other. And because of that, you want to put them together. That leads to intensified processes, two things happening in the same equipment. This can be done with ordinary reactions, with typical catalyst, uh, catalysts, or it can be with biocatalysts, that is microorganisms or enzymes that are trapped somewhere, so then you have bioreactive separations. And you see that those are more or less under development still. Lots of research is going into these things currently. They are applied. Some are actually applied on large scale, especially these reactive separations. And, well, um, nevertheless, lots of research needs to be done in these areas. So these two topics will be dealt with in the advanced topics, advanced chapters of this lecture, where the basic lecture focuses on the classical separations. With that, with that, let's summarize what I've been telling you. On the one hand side, I show, have shown you that there are thermal separations frequently used and I showed, told you some of the examples, distillation, extraction, absorption, those that are being dealt with in the basic lecture. On the other hand side, I've shown you that combining process steps for enhanced performance, intensified processes can be achieved and they are still topic of ongoing research. With that, thank you for this time. Hope to see you again next time.